Beloved and friends, let me begin by just reminding us that it's easy to talk on this subject and assume that this is an agenda, that, 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 that I'm presenting an agenda wherein I am an American using my Christianity to defend my America. And I want to flip that around in our hearts while I thank God for this nation I'm a Christian in America, and I'm using what's happening in America to help Christ's church bring glory and honor to him and prepare Christ's church for persecution. Does that make sense? There are two ways you can approach this as an American Christian. I want to make very clear, I'm approaching it as a Christian. First and foremost, a slave to Christ, desiring to myself be prepared and to prepare those among us for martyrdom. I don't think it's going to happen in my lifetime, but there's a lot of things I don't think that could happen. So I pray that you would understand my heart motive, and I don't delight in in learning about a lot of the difficulties that are out in the chaos of our culture. I tell you, each time I I spend so much time meditating in the things around us, I, I, I find a tremendous weight. It's a depressing weight. So I come at you tonight, burdened even for you in this way. Well, what I want to do is move into now this session, this sixth session on Christ and culture by looking at cultural communication. In each of its campaigns, as we've looked at the culture, in particular wokeism, in each of the, its campaigns, there is a veil of supposed virtue. A veil of supposed virtue, like a veneer. A veneer that boasts in appearance that is contrary to substance. Have you all seen that? You know, cheap furniture? It's a, it's, it's a veneer that makes it look like expensive oak, but it's just an appearance. And it actually is, is contrary because it's an appearance intending to, to present value to you, hiding its real substance, press board. That's the kind of thing we find in this campaign of the culture that's going mad The icons here of Woke's false advertisement have been seen in each of the various categories. We started by considering just what is Woke itself, Wokeness, and we we understand that it's a worldview, that it's it's a worldview. It's not just one incident here or an isolated issue of racism or addressing the problems in society concerning justice or a matter of human sexuality. No, no, there's a, there is a worldview that is being promoted. We considered cultural Marxism, and here I want to show you the veneer, because each of these campaigns have a veil of supposed virtue. And so the veneer of cultural Marxism is this is for the good of all. It's for the good of the whole. And you will hear this language, you'll see it on social media, you'll hear it even in commercials and talk radio and all over the media, you'll hear the concept of it's the good for society, it's the good for all. Social justice has the veil of virtue by claiming that this is to advance justice and equity and and righteousness among people. In critical race theory, the veneer is again to be against racism. In cultural sexuality, the veneer is love. Love. Why would you oppose love? You see, in each of these cases, the the Christian church can easily be duped because if we look at the veneer and assume that there's a quality there of substance, 
We have failed. We have been deceived. Of course we are for the good of society. Of course we want to promote justice and equity. Of course we are against racism passionately. Of course we promote love. We serve the God of love. But let us not be fooled by the veneer. Last week we looked at cultural sexuality and, and, I, and I started with the picture of a child being taught and told by all these different voices that if he touches the pan that's scorching hot, he's not going to be burned. And when we read Romans 1 last week, we, we saw that, that God reveals very plainly that the evidence is in them and the evidence is apparent and they are without excuse. And I suggest to you this is true genuinely in all the categories, but especially sexuality. Nature proves touching the pan would be equal to seeing that a male and a female are designed to be compatible sexually. No other combination. Nature teaches us undeniable truths, no matter how many people tell us otherwise, no matter how many people or what institutions or what voices try to justify a view contrary to reality. I want to start there because what we're dealing with in this session is really a culmination of all that we've considered so far. And we're kind of coming full circle now back to cultural Marxism. We're, we're realizing that in each of these scenarios, in each of these particular categories, that there is a propaganda. There is the promotion of a worldview by means of communication. And today's focus, I want us to understand that the culture communicates to us this agenda in various ways. So let's take a look on page one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, for the sake of time, I'm going to go and skip over quite a few of these things. Let me, let me begin here by saying at the top of world's, words of culture that what you're going to find is a pretext throughout how the culture communicates to us. Always this is the case. There's always a pretext um, because pretexts hide realities. They hide agendas. They, they, they are the veneer. They are the, the catchwords that draw you in and, and get your support. They are the things like Black Lives Matter that you can say yes to, and then you take a bite of the bait. And you've been brought in, and you find that it's a Trojan horse. This is the nature of the words of our culture. They have not only hijacked language so as to use the word social the phrase social justice to mean something different they've not only hijacked language they've hijacked the voice of culture itself so that this agenda now this this worldview is has taken the microphone of society and it now is the voice it tells you what is true and what is not regardless of if the pan is hot. So here's the nature of what we have, a pretext. And it goes something like this. I'm gonna to submit to you that this again comes, traces back very definitively to, cultural, to, to classical Marxism through the means of cultural Marxism, through the Frankfurt School and so forth. And what you find through this tracing, which we'll look at later, um, you're gonna find that really it, it brilliantly started in our universities. So I want you to get the picture in mind now of termites. And the infrastructure of the next generation of at least this nation is the infrastructure is going to be those people coming into that next generation. And, and the foundation and infrastructure of the building of the nation, well, it's the the lumber that's being provided for that is being milled in the universities. And termites 
have been actively but invisibly to, the, to most eyes, actively eating away at the very structural integrity of generation after generation. We are now in an America that all it took was a little wind of COVID and an opportunity in 2020 when everyone's locked down to see the whole thing starting to collapse. So with that in mind, remember these things are not just today or yesterday or last year, but this is really the consequence of decades of erosion from this worldview. The game plan is revolution. We've looked at that with Marxism. And let me just give you a simple three-step game plan for how that could work in communication. Number one, you dress in the claim of a, of a, noble, claw, of a noble cause. So you, you put on the, the, the veneer of a noble cause. Second, you exploit every means of communicating that it is a noble cause. And third, you silence all descending voices. You catch that? Here's the recipe for revolution in the culture. Number one, you dress in a noble cause. Number two, you exploit every means of communication. Number three, you silence every opposing voice. With that recipe in mind, I suggest to you that's what we have before us. I'm going to briefly just summarize these uh, for the sake of time again. So here we find I first start with history, and what I'm talking about here is revisionism. This concept of, of the education authorities in our nation and elsewhere going back and taking books like Yale University had, has, has had the best um, uh, curriculum for art music. There was a, a, a specific art music history and they completely took the book off the shelf because it gave too much attention to European art. And they replaced it now with, with curriculum that exalts all kinds of other art and downplays European art. That's just a simple example, not necessarily harmful in and of itself, perhaps. But here's the issue. It's denying history. And so you go through, and it, whether benign or, or very maliciously, you rewrite history. And it's very true that if you rewrite the past, you can control the future. The way to revolution is to, is to basically cause people to forget their legacy their roots, and to rewrite history for them so they can commit the same errors again. So communism can be good. So rewriting history is a very important feature in the words of our culture, and it's everywhere, everywhere. I can't tell you how many, especially in science, how many textbooks have been rewritten, rewritten, rewritten for the sake of promoting an agenda. And for the sake of excluding truths that have laboriously been discovered. Well, I also want to encourage you to remember George Orwell's Thought Police. I would encourage you to, you know, read 1984 because Orwell had an, a prophetic insight in terms of what is happening in our culture and specifically in the area of revisionism of, of history. Right? Do you remember the characters there? I don't have time to get into it, but a fascinating, fascinating fictional portrayal of how they had to rewrite history. Literally, they, they had factories to take in and, and destroy all history and rewrite it. Well, we see that in the destruction of monuments because these monuments were not limited to figures and representations of racism. These monuments extended to essentially anything American and beyond. Because, as I have quoted here, uh, in one example, one activist during the riots last year um, actually stated, no uncertain terms, all murals and stained glass windows of white Jesus and his European mother are there 
and their white friends should also come down. They are a gross form of white supremacy created as tools of oppression, racist propaganda. They should all come down. They justified breaking church windows because of that. How about the media? I won't spend time here, but you know, and there's, you could write a whole book just on how media, whether it be from Hollywood or whether it be from the news, supposedly so-called, or whether it be from uh, even social media platforms, even vendors like Amazon, media has become something so powerful in our techno age, and it is a very key device to controlling information. So it's a part of this as well. And moving on to violence, I, could only, I will only allude to uh, Antifa and a few other examples. You can turn the page there to page four. And just to note that there was a great deal of violence that took place in the name of justice, violence against people's property and even people themselves that were not propagating any kind of injustice, and this is called justice. There's such a, a tragic hypocrisy in this worldview. It's more than irony. There's a tragic hypocrisy. Um, so you can see there, I have some quotes, and I'll expand on this even later, just to give some accounts of the types of extreme violence that had been perpetrated in the name of justice. Uh, I'll just note to a, a couple of thoughts I put down. Um, mobs do not build up, they tear down. And a mob embodies passion and force, not reason and peace. So when you get people together and, and you rally them up, what is, the, what is the driving engine in what they do? It's certainly not rational discourse. Instead, it's passion. There's an energy in synergy. More numbers heightens the adrenaline. More adrenaline, less logic. And you have this nature of these mobs in these, in these protests and even, again, in, the, in Antifa and various, and we remember Rodney King decade ago or more, and, and, and just constantly you find this same, this same worldview raising its head in forms. How does it communicate to the culture? Sometimes in violence. Sometimes in violence. And I'm addressing that because I want us to see now intimidation. How does it communicate its agenda? Well, I've already hinted. It's really not interested in rational discourse because it's really not interested in truth. It doesn't want to talk about the biology of human sexuality. It doesn't want to talk about the facts of origins. Instead, it wants you to believe what it says. And if intimidation is necessary, so be it. Intimidation, then, uh, Winston Churchill said this, that an appeaser is one who feeds a crocodile hoping it'll eat him last. A very wise perception. The idea is that what you find even in our world today, big businesses and even small businesses and even individuals capitulate to the agenda because they're intimidated and they, they feed the crocodile hoping they don't get devoured. So an example here in the, just below Churchill's quote, according to the radical secularists, unapproved speech has to be shut down, even with violence if necessary. In March of 2017, a mob at Middlebury College in Vermont refused to allow social scientist Charles Murray to speak. The protesting students shouted, pounding on the walls, and even activated fire alarms. They assaulted a professor, giving her a concussion, and Murray himself came close to being beaten. His research reached conclusions about race, the welfare system, and the American experience that did not meet the criteria of the thought police. It, it, didn't, it didn't meet their ideology. Now, now you've got to understand... Murray is a respect, otherwise respected science, social scientist, and he was invited 
He was invited to the college to speak. But this activist group cannot tolerate what he has to say. So they don't discourse. They resort to intimidating violence. Violence and intimidation have displaced rational discourse. This is my proposition. Another example, in 1973, homosexual activists persuaded the American Psychiatric, Psychiatric Association to remove homosexuality from its list of psychiatric illnesses and reclassify it as normal behavior. Did you hear that? It used to be on the books as, a, as an illness, a mental illness. So what, what happened to that? Well, it was changed. It's no longer. Was it changed because of some scientific study? Was it be changed because of evidence? Was it changed because of a new discovery? <laughs> no. It was changed because of intimidation. What happened was, and again, I'll continue reading now, this change was made not on account of scientific data, but because radicals planned a, syst a systematic effort to disrupt the annual meetings of the APA. Three years earlier, activists grabbed the microphone in an APA meeting and said, psychiatry is the enemy incarnate. Psychiatry has waged a relentless war of extermination against us. These are LGBT community people. We, you may take this as a declaration of war against you. We're reje rejecting you all as our owners. And there's more to this story. There were threats on lives of people. There was damage to personal property. There was shaming of personal names in social media and so forth. Another example of shame was the CEO and co-founder of Mozilla, the Firefox browser that you might use? Well, he was pressured, and, well, technically he was fired. Why? Because he donated $1,000 to Prop 8, to the Cal Save California or California Families. Remember years ago, they were putting forward Prop 8 to support marriage as one man and one woman? He gave $1,000 to the effort. He got fired. That's his private business. That's, his pri that's private. That, they have no... That company has nothing to do with... But why did the company do that? Well, because the LGBT community came around and pressured him, pressured the company, and threatened personally until finally he was fired. They denounced him as a hateful, as hateful and a bigot. It reminds me also of our own, our very own beloved... Aaron C. Wall, astrophysicist. I'm a little bit biased because I like physics. But do you remember if you were here, we had Aaron Wall here literally just weeks before he moved? And Aaron C. Wall, if you don't know his name, you can look it up later, but he is um, presently the foremost brilliant mind for astrophysics and his primary focus is on black holes. So he right now is the most advanced research scientist on black holes in history. And he is presently living in England and lecturing at Cambridge University. But let me tell you the personal story. I went to have dinner with him one night and uh, picked him up in the car. He sat in the back. And I remember asking him, so how, how was the situation? Because I had heard that when he went to visit Cambridge, when they made the offer to him before he came back and talked with his wife and decided to move there, um, the issue was that there was a massive pushback. So much so that the BBC came and there was protests of over 70 students. And let me just give you kind of a summary here. One of the articles that was printed in one of the most well-known respected papers in England, the title of the article was Cambridge's LGBT plus math moss respond to hiring Aaron Wall in light of homophobic blog posts. Now, in the article, it has one of the prominent students saying this, 
You don't expect people like this to exist anymore, and especially not be hired at Cambridge University. <laughs> Another student said this, can he really, no, I'm sorry, this, I believe this was a, uh, one of the other s- faculty. Can he really take himself out of the situation of being homophobic and actually give someone real advice? I don't think so. What was his crime? What did Aaron Wall do to receive such attention? BBC, all kinds of news press, possibly his offer being retracted. The president of Cambridge was threatened. If you hire him, there will be consequences. What could possibly, what, be, what could possibly be his crime? I'll tell you. Glad you asked. He has a personal blog because he's a Christian. And his blog is entitled Undivided Looking. And what he writes about is he writes about physics and Christianity. So I read it. And he happened to post something in 2015, way before any thought of Cambridge. And and what he posted on his personal blog that has all kinds of Christian stuff on it, what he posted was this. And I quote, same-sex couples engage in unnatural sexual acts. And the only other thing they brought up was another quote. Same-sex marriage hurts only the couples themselves. Period, end quote. That's his crime. So there is a a way here that this worldview will seek to intimidate, will seek to shame, will seek to ridicule and destroy. It has zero tolerance, though it boasts that it is tolerance. And that's where we move right into censorship. Well, you know, right above that, I have this idea that silence is violence. And you know, that was the Black Lives Matter uh, slogan. And it, it essentially, what does that say? But if you're not with us, you are against us. Which, by the way, if you look at the words of Jesus, he inverts that. An entirely different principle, oppositional, antithetical. Which brings us to censorship. I'll Our culture demonstrates little interest in rational discourse, as I've said. That is the nature of censorship. It will block, censor certain information. Let's just think about free speech for a moment. Free speech is the hope of freedom. That's what I say. Free speech is the hope for freedom. Why do I say it that way? Because without free speech, you have no hope for truth. And without truth, you have no hope for liberty. I'll come back to that later. But this is my point. When speech is no longer free, truth is chained. And when truth is chained, liberty is destroyed. Let me give you an example of how, again, this free speech matter is attacked by cultural Marxism. In 1977, the National Socialist Party of America marched through the suburbs where hundreds of Holocaust survivors lived. They spewed their hatred of Jews there. Now listen to this carefully. They were initially denied a permit to march, but they took it to court. And when they took it to court, the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, came to their defense and took their case all the way to the Supreme Court. You can look up the Supreme Court under that title, National Socialist Party of America versus Village of Skokie. The ACLU insisted that free speech was free speech no matter how offensive. Did you hear that? That's what it used to mean. Free speech is free speech no matter how offensive. I would even argue this very simply. It is not free speech if you allow people to speak that you agree with. 
That's not free speech. Free speech fundamentally is that you allow speech that you don't agree with. In other words, let me translate. Offensive. But that's not our world anymore, is it? No, instead, I would argue this, that political, that should be political, political correctness, PC, is the seeding or seedling of censorship. We've been slowly becoming accustomed in our culture to PC, political correctness. It's built on this selectively sensitive principle of offense. You might offend somebody. It is, it is a gateway to censorship because it overthrows that principle that the Supreme Court ordered to say free speech is free speech no matter how offensive. But political correctness has been teaching us now for decades. Oh, no, 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 no. We just can't offend. Instead, if you offend, that's hate. That's hate speech. And that's where this is going. So I find it striking that the champions of tolerance oppose free speech. Lutzer has some excellent things to say on this. You'll notice I, I depend on him very much in, this, in these notes here. He had so many accessible things I could just share with you and quote. He says this, that our gen- ours is a generation where many are offended simply by legitimate opposing viewpoints. Here again, the culture has found its way into the church. This is my argument now. This has found its way even into the church. One survey states that nearly half of millennials agree that speech should be limited that offends minority groups. 40% of people who claim to be Christian are saying, yeah, you know what? Yeah, we, we shouldn't allow speech that offends minority groups. It sounds virtuous. Because a Christian should say, I don't want anyone to offend. Right. We don't want anyone, we don't want to be offensive. We don't want anyone else to be offensive. But, but what they fail, it's again the bait and switch. It's, it's the veneer. It's the, it's the thin little advertisement that you can bite into. And, but it's bait. What they don't realize is when you start talking about limiting speech you unwittingly attack the very foundation of freedom. So, here's what I'm going to challenge with that. What, what people are missing here is who defines offensive? Right now, you might agree with what they're saying is offensive. But 10 years from now, you might not. Who defines what is offensive? That which qualifies for hate speech is growing, by the way. And I've already read in several places that there there is already hate speech laws passed in Canada that a pastor cannot speak against homosexuality. It's hate speech. For example, to assert that there are only two genders is considered offensive and is in some places already counted as hate speech. Those who boast most of inclusiveness are most exclusive to those who do not agree with them. Now here's where I want to tie it back to cultural Marxism so that we can see the connections. Marxist philosopher Herbert Marcuse in no uncertain terms, wrote this. The restoration of freedom, now this is in his ideology as he's projecting out the the utopia that Marx promises. He says the restoration of freedom, meaning we, in any any what he calls capitalist system, we are are not free. Okay, that's, that's, (laughs) what an oxymoron. Free market, not free. Okay, so here we go. He, He says, the restoration of freedom of thought may necessitate new and rigid restrictions on teachings and practices in the educational institutions, which, by their very methods and concepts, serve to enclose the mind within the established universe of discourse and behavior. Okay, that's a mouthful. What he simply means is sort of double talk. He's basically saying very... Plainly, our version of freedom 
requires rigid restrictions imposed on everyone for what they can think and say. And thereby, we need to rope the mind into a certain universe of thought and behavior. That's a Marxist. That's what he's saying that all people in the world should have and pursue. Rejecting, or sorry, reflecting on Marcuse, um, the editor, editorial director at the American Institute for Economic Research, Tucker says this, Marcuse says that if you oppose policies like Social Security or Obamacare, you should be denied the freedom of speech and assembly. You should be shut up and beat up. The path toward true freedom is through massive real-world oppression. If you have the wrong views, you have no rights. Okay, do you see how this moves now? We're talking, it's not about views anymore. It's about one view. You have to have this view. You have to have the woke view. If you don't, you have no rights. Lutzer cites Marcuse indicating that he, quote, wrote that he must put an end to the liberal creed of free and equal discussion and to be militantly intolerant. Did you hear that? Militantly intolerant. There's the command from a Marxist philosopher. David Horwitz, who knows Marxism well, he is one who suffered under the regime of the Nazis. Listen to what he says. He, he talks about how this played out. Either him or his family, I just know that he suffered under its under its uh, darkness. It says this, to respect oppressors' rights is to support the injustices they commit. If social justice is to be achieved, one must suppress the perpetrators of injustice by depriving them of their rights. That is why progressives, cultural Marxists, are so intolerant and seek to suppress the free speech of those who oppose them. You see, let me translate. His point is, their, their thinking is that, well, the dominant, the dominant is the oppressor group, and the oppressor group controls what is said. So it's actually virtuous to censor because what you're doing is you're actually, you're virtuously stopping the mouth of the oppressor and giving voice to the oppressed. So that's the mentality behind justifying censorship in our day. It's to, it's to shut the mouth of the oppressor group and to give exclusive voice, at least that's the, the ideological paradigm, to give exclusive voice to the oppressed group. Well, in 1997, psychologist Nicholas Humphrey gave the Oxford Amnesty Lecture for that year, the purpose of which was to argue in favor of censorship. You hear that? In favor of censorship against freedom of expression. Specifically, it was to censor moral and religious education, especially the education of child, that a child receives at home. Now, listen to this quote. Listen to what he said in his lecture. He told this to Oxford University. Children have a right to have their mind, have, sorry, children have a right not to have their minds addled by nonsense. And we, as a society, you hear that? We, as a society, have a duty to protect them from it. So we should no more allow parents to teach their children to believe, for example, in the literal truth of the Bible or that the planets rule their lives than we should allow parents to knock their children's teeth out or lock them in a dungeon. 1997. Now, I want to make this very clear. The importance of communication is vital to any multi-party system to any society. Communication is vital. How are conflicting views, if we have different views in our culture, which we do abundantly, 
How are they resolved? Communication. So if you begin to throttle, control, censor, shut down communication, how do you expect to resolve conflict? You don't. This mechanism is a mechanism of force. It's a mechanism that itself is thoroughly oppressive. With that in mind, wokeness is not interested in truth, resolution, and peace. Victory by whatever means is closer to the aim. In fact, one has well said that speech is a weapon in the conflict between groups that are unequal. Now, Sal- now Salman uh, Rushdie, a writer, he, he lives under protection because he wrote against, he exposed some of the things in the Quran, and some radical Islamists are seeking to kill us to kill him, take his life. And so he lives now under, in hiding and under protection. He writes this. Listen to what he says. Very important because what he's saying is he's speaking from the experience. And, and, and what I'm skipping over here is, is a lot of thought that deals with other worldviews like Islam. Islam does not believe in free speech. In fact, Islam is trying to persuade the UN to pass international law against free speech on the basis that some, quote, free speech would be blasphemy to Allah. So he knows that system, and he knows that free speech is is not at all acceptable to Islam. He's now in America, and he has come to appreciate American value. Wittingly or not, I don't know if he understands the Christian principle behind it, but here, nevertheless, this is what he says, and it's brilliant. He says, the idea that any kind of free society can be constructed in which people will never be offended or insulted is absurd. He goes on, people have the fundamental right to take an argument to the point where somebody is offended by what they say. It is no trick to support the free speech of of somebody you agree with or to whose opinion you are indifferent. The defense of, now this is a key, key Sentence, the defense of free speech begins at the point where people say something you can't stand. If you can't defend their right to say it, then you don't believe in free speech. You only believe in free speech as long as it doesn't get up your nose. And we know what he means. Again, like Jesus said, if you love those that love you, what is that? If you give free speech to those who agree with you, what is that? No, free speech is proven essentially when there is strong disagreement. But it, oh, and I'm going to have to skip this. Uh, The cancel culture, you know, where they're pulling books, they're pulling products, renaming football teams. Uh, This is is the way this worldview communicates. It has to revise and cancel because it has the mic. And it's telling you what is right and wrong. And people everywhere, including football team owners, are capitulating. Just remember um, the thread that connects them. So let's look at that next page, page eight, the thread that connects them, the common thread. These are the tactics used to advance a cause and a culture. All of these, these are the tactics. Os Guinness traces the historical development of Marxism from its classical roots to its cultural fruits. I'll let you read that later. Let me just give you um, a, a couple of other examples. I remember in science, um, I had just recently came out of the lab not long before this. And so in 2008, Ben Stein came out with this, this documentary called Expelled. Do you remember that? where he, he, here he is going around interviewing schools and scientists, institutions, laboratories. I mean, phenomenal, direct evidence that, that people who spoke against evolution, whether they were Christian or not, if they just spoke against evolution, they were being ostracized academically. They were being fired. They, there was lies around why they were dismissed. There was all kinds of mistreatment, and he sought to expose it. I remember, for example, too, these things happen where it's, it's hush-hush. We, we used to do X Club here. X Club is where 
church volunteers, and a number of you even in this room joined me in this, we went to Britain uh, Middle School, and we, for two years, we would go every, was it Wednesday, I think, or Tuesday, but we went every, every week, and we had this Christian club on the school campus. And I taught these little kids, and I had some other helpers teach, but I just loved preaching to these little kids. We, we had this time where we, we brought all kinds of activities, did things on the board, showed them slides. It was so amazing. Totally a voluntary Christian club. There was also a, an Islam club on campus. Now watch this. We got in the first year, it was great. But then the, that principle was dismissed. The new principal comes in, before we could start the school year, he wanted to talk to me. And immediately he had, he had concern about our club. He let us continue for a while. And then we got the notice. And he basically told me, we can't have the club anymore. And he didn't tell me why. He just said, well, you know, it was all this language about, well, the school board and funds and da da and da 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 and everything else, just completely irrelevant. I said, all right. We backed out, and then I checked months later, and the Islam club was still going. Now, I suggest to you, these are some examples of how the culture communicates its agenda. It's happening everywhere. With that in mind, I need to bring us to a close. I want to take you to the words of Christ, please, and understand now how, what does Christ say about these things? Well, let me begin by saying that the Lord reveals to us very importantly that communication is, is a premium. He, he reveals to us that, that, that words themselves have tremendous power. You just remember these few Statements, Proverbs 10, 10, 20. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver. The heart of the wicked is of little worth. Eleven nine. With his mouth, the godless man would destroy his neighbor, but by knowledge, the righteous are delivered. Eleven eleven. By the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted. You hear that? There'll be prosperity even within the land when people use their communication rightly. And the integrity and the righteousness is indexed by God and not men. Then it says, but by the mouth of the wicked, it will be overthrown. In 12, 18, there is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise will bring healing. 17, 10, a rebuke goes deeper into a man of understanding than a hundred blows into a fool. You can become very frustrated trying to deal with the culture and communication, especially this craziness of back and forth on social media. It is like a hundred blows and you get nowhere. In 1821, Proverbs 1821, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. Death and life in the power of our communication. I want you to think about that seriously. Now I want us to think about the power of how the culture communicates. Either death or life. The power of how you communicate. Death and life. And I want us to think now about the, the, the basics of what we've covered tonight. And what we've covered is this idea of, of how things are said. Violence, intimidation, shame, slander, ridicule. We, we've, we've discussed what is said. If you're not with me, you are against me. And it's this content that is the only true content. And we've discussed also not only how something is said, what is said, but we've also discussed, well, the truthfulness of the content. Is it true or not? And I want you to remember in terms of how we think about the words of Christ, our Lord places the highest premium on truth. He says things like this in 1217 of Proverbs, whoever speaks the truth gives honest evidence, but a false witness utters deceit. 12, 19, and 20. Truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Deceit is in the heart of those who devise evil, but those who plan peace 
have joy. Ephesians 4.15, that the church is to speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. There's all of our categories right there. The way we are to do it in the manner of love. What we are to speak, truth. 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 In verse 25, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak truth, the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. We are also to speak gentle. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And I have many more. We are also to speak to encourage, to edify, to build up. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth except only that which is good for building up, that it might give grace for the moment, that it might give grace to those who hear. So these are just reminders for us. And finally, I would say accountability should be a reminder to us. I tell you, on that day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. For by their words, you will be judged or you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. I want to leave us now. I'm going to ask you to turn in your copy of God's word to John chapter 8. And let's just very, very briefly look at three things here. John chapter 8, verse 31. I want you to just take to heart three words, okay? Three words with me, and we'll be done. Three words. The first word is, I want you to take the idea of the word itself, W-O-R-D, word. Next, I want you to take truth, and next, I want you to take liberty. Word, truth, liberty. We've talked about that. We've talked about that tonight. We've talked about what is communicated word. We've talked about if it's true or not. And we've talked about liberty, freedom of speech. You know fundamentally why I am convinced that freedom of speech in this nation and anywhere else it is found in the Western world is based fundamentally on Christian principle and not just philosophy. Cer certainly, John Locke stood on the shoulders of the reformers and saw the value and said, yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense. But do you know who really was one of the very, very first to champion the principle of free speech? Modeling it for the world to see? Well, we just celebrated the other day. At the Diet of Worms, 1521, Martin Luther stands before the council, and the emperor of the most powerful kingdom in the world. And they charged him to take his life if he would not retract what he said. Not what he did, what he said. And Martin Luther came forward with this statement that I do not agree with the authority of popes and councils. Did you hear that? That's making a statement, I don't buy the agenda. I don't buy the propaganda. I don't, I'm not bound. My mouth isn't bound by what you tell me is true. And he gave them two, two grounds. I believe one primary and one secondary. Primary ground, the word of God. Secondary ground, conscience which he also called reason. His point, if I am not convinced by scripture and plain reason, for to go against scripture is neither safe nor right, and to go against conscience, he said, therefore, I will not, I cannot recant. Here I stand, I can do no other, God Help me. Amen. He didn't know if he was going to be arrested at that moment and his head chopped off. Come what may, he stood for the principle of this. Now catch this, beloved. He knew the truth. And because he knew the truth, that was enough. He could not be silenced because of the truth. 
What you find today in our culture is they play games with words and they play games with who can speak and they play games with who can tweet and they play games with what you hear because their words don't have the power to convince you. So they have to play games to convince you. Whenever anyone has the truth, they're not afraid for everyone to speak. That's why free speech is built upon the principles of Christianity. Because if you know the truth, you're not afraid for everyone else to speak. I'm not afraid to have you hear things that Islam teaches. I'm not afraid for you to hear atheists. Because I am totally convinced that the scripture presenting the gospel of my Lord Jesus Christ is true. And if you have ears to hear the truth, I don't need to control what you hear you will come to the truth. So let them talk. Let everyone oppose what I say. It it doesn't bother me. But if you have a worldview that cannot stand up to the scrutiny of the power of other words, you have to play games like censor, like Say who can say what. Oh, and you can't say that. I'm going to send you to jail for saying something. What? Where have we gone? Here are the three words in play. Look at it with me. John 8, 31. You're going to see where I'm getting this idea of free speech. Look at how Jesus presents it. The context is different here, but I think the principle still stands. Listen, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, who had believed him, if you abide, here's our first word, In my word. In other words, Jesus is saying, what I have spoken in the context of John, what I have spoken is true. That's the whole debate in chapter six and seven. What I have spoken is true, he's saying. That's all I need. I don't need to play games with you hearing different things. What I said is true. So he says, if you abide in that, if you stay with that truth, then you are truly my disciples. And now notice the next word, our next word. And you will know the what? The truth. If the words are true, you don't play games. You're not afraid to hear different opinions. If the words are true, Jesus just says, no, my words are true. If you abide in them, you will know the truth. And this is the consequence. And the truth will what? Set you free. See, there's no, there's no fear when you deal with true words, words of truth. Do you remember when he stood before Pilate? And he said, what is true? What is truth? Jesus said right there, look, I don't need to play games. I don't need to call down angels. I don't need any of this. I'm willing to go die. You have no power over me. Why, what kind of liberty did he display? A liberty that knows the truth. And Christianity from its birth is the truth that has always advanced not by playing games with speech, but always advanced by proclaiming words of truth. So I get especially charged when I see a culture that wants to play games with speech and words and censorship because I know inside they're scared that they will lose their power if the truth was unleashed. Let us be a people in deep humility, not be intimidated. And let me ask you all, don't get caught up in conspiracy theories. Don't get caught up in in, 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 in the fear mongering. Don't get caught up in all the, 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 the constant mantra of intimidation out there and the shame. I pray that everyone in this room would be prepared to stand on the truth, even to martyrdom. That's what we're called to. He is worthy. The truth is true. I don't need I don't need anything else to convince me. I pray that we would not be afraid to communicate that way to our culture with deep humility. 
Let's pray. Father, thank you again for the time you've given us. Help us to focus on the words that you have revealed. Help us to remember the importance of words and what they communicate, that you created the heavens and the earth even by the power of words. Help us to remember that the gospel gives eternal life through the power of words preached and believed. Help us to be a people that honor and uphold and walk with integrity and confidence in the words you have revealed. Help us to show our culture around us that it's not consistent, nor right, nor does it show any sense of integrity to play games with what is said and who says it. I pray, Father, you give us the wisdom we need to communicate Christ to our culture, and I pray that you'd give us the strength we need to be prepared for whatever kind of persecution may come for your glory and for our everlasting joy, we pray in Christ. Amen.